An Armory show is first and foremost kind of um, an homage to the 1913 Armory show. And um, uh, every few years I find myself not by design doing a kind of curatorial project. And was a little bit surprised when this turned into a curatorial project. But you know, we've been talking about what to do for six months and I uh, had some ideas about um, transforming the space architecturally. In fact, my pitch to Ken originally was, you make the outside of something and I'll make the inside, I'll fill that. And, and that's because I think I, I was interested in, in the sort of um, narrative, clean slate of his paper pieces, which, you know, as, as evocative as they were for him, they're also a bit of, a bit of like um, ghost vehicles or something for the viewer. And I always found myself like projecting my own stories onto his kind of um, ghostly landscapes. And I thought how interesting it would be since I'm usually making everything, the inside and the outside of my installations, that um, uh, if I kind of let go of a part of it, how interesting it would be to kind of um, take my kind of more research-based projects and intersect it with his memory-based projects. Because even though that's sometimes a tool that I work with and I've often adopted personas to make work, you know, I've become a character in order to produce an installation like the piece at Mass Mocha, All Utopias Fell. I'm mostly doing a lot of research and I'm encountering a lot of imagery and objects and, and stumbling over physical things. And Ken relies only on his memory to, to generate these narratives. And I thought that would be an interesting combination, so I pitched him the idea of doing the show at the Opalka, learning that the armory, the New Scotland Armory was, you know, designed and started being built in 1913, I thought what a great parallel it is to the armory in New York on Park. Um, and started thinking about how with this 100th anniversary we should do something with that. So what I would do is that I would manufacture photographs of my memory. And so that set up the paradigm of everything that I make has to come from memory. I can't use outside sources or visual sources. Otherwise, that's information that other people can access. I don't know what it's going to look like. I have no idea, right? You know, I have a fairly good idea. I've made some sketches and I've, and I've made these schematics. And I know in my head what it's supposed to be, but I don't know it until it's built, right? So a lot of times it takes five or six times. For, for example, you know, in um, my junkyard, right? So each time I do something, I have to make it solid, make it three-dimensional, and then see, does it feel right? Uh, and then if it doesn't, I have to do it again, you know, until it's, it's right. So for instance, you know, if I'm making a, uh, a Volkswagen um, van, it's not in any one of these, but, um, you know, I'll make a sketch of what I, what I think it should look like somewhere in here. Ah, the first sketch. So there's the side, sort of vague, figuring out how a curve might work, seeing what this overall shape might be, and say, oh, that's pretty good. And then I can lay that down on a piece of paper, at which point, you know, it gets drawn out by hand with all these straight lines. And then once it's done, it wraps itself around to become, you know, a little bam. But of course this one wasn't right. You know, the, it was somehow too square. Uh, it didn't feel Volkswagen y. So I had to readjust. So I change the lines and then I do another one. And here's another one. And here's another one. This one was closer. This one was much closer. You can see that it even has that nice little V in the front. Um, and then the tabs, you know, stick it together. And everything, when I do it, is designed with this system of tabs and slots. They work pretty well. They stay together. But what I liked about it is that it wasn't permanent. That I could take it back apart again and it would go flat. And I could store it away somewhere and then go back to it. And because thoughts and memories aren't permanent. You know, they're, they're in flux. They, uh, they, um, they, they change. Everything changes. And so to be able to actually physically change the source material for the photographs is a great thing because that too relates to how I think.
The process for this is kind of like the process for making these collages. You know, um, I like to get myself in front of real material. Uh, I never buy anything from the internet to make my work with. I always buy my books in person. And when I'm doing installations, it's almost always at the invitation of a city or a museum or, you know, um, private individuals or a not-for-profit. And I like to go to that place and just kind of spend some time in it. Mm -hmm. And um, even though it was a little bit more difficult than usual uh, at the outset to kind of uh, be at the armory and be working for extended periods of time of just like kind of being in the place, um, as you know, it's such a it's a powerful environment that it was really easy to kind of think about the stuff that we would want to pull out from it. So I began to pull things out of it that were like how I would approach collage, you know, grouping stuff, thinking about certain kinds of themes. And uh, it's hard to not think about kind of that military history. And it was a short couple of steps to thinking about the terms that the art world has borrowed from the military, like avant-garde, right? Or the, the vanguard, the advanced guard. And, and so, also, the museum show was, or the armory show was positioned so much as a kind of revolutionary event in America that, um, you know, everything from Walt Kuhn's design of the flag, you know, like a regimental flag, um, positioned this artwork as like a charge. Um, and so thinking about this region and how influential it's been on me, I mean, I, I think being here from from the early uh, 90s as a graduate student. Uh, you know, I've been sort of more radicalized by being in Troy in the Capital District than any of the schoolwork that I had. You know, I was like encountering history here, meeting artists. And so the more Ken and I talked about it, the more it was obvious that there, the set of influences that were here was something we'd like to revisit as curators. And, um, but that all came out of material. It all came out of like the encounter with objects the thinking about strategies for exhibition and how um, you know museums were changing. You know they were going from this kind of salon uh, atmosphere into something that was more domestic in a way. And it would be a long time before the White Cube would come along. But I think being in those spaces where there was both like military activity and then these guys sleeping there, um, recreational rooms, uh, games that would be played. You know we thought that it could be really interesting to transpose that stuff to the gallery. I think it's super dynamic and um, uh, I think we can use them in a lot of ways. You know, we're, we're going floor to ceiling and stuff, you know. I read, um, and we're having little groupings and clusters of things. Yeah, it's well, I'm kind of basing it on um, Herbert and Louise Vogel's apartment. Yeah. Um, that too. The Army Show and Herbert. Oh, Vogel. and the Barnes Collection and the Mertzbau. I mean, you know, we're having couches where you can sit and, you know, I really want the turn, if you will, like in a magic trick of going from Ken's 45 foot long, you know, uh, sheetrock tank uh, and then going under the tread and then coming into this opulent sort of, in, I think, inviting space. The studio visits um, are really interesting for me um, because I get to see how other people think, right? And when you go to a studio visit, it's, it's kind of a long journey. You're talking about what you're going to expect when you get there. And I know something about a lot of people's work because I've seen it out. I've seen it in, in galleries and whatever. So when you get there, it's always a little bit of a surprise, right? Because they're going to show you things that you've probably never seen before. In fact, I want to see things that I haven't seen before. I want to see the newest, you know, sort of thing that's happening. Where are they now? Um, so when you go in and you start to talk, and then what you're really looking for, or what I'm looking for, is something that in some way not only fits the vision for the show, because every show has a certain kind of theme, sort of narrative, and especially in the case for this show, but very specifically about themes and narratives. And so we were looking in sort of intentionally for work that was really fresh, right? And in many cases, the work that we picked were things that the artists didn't really want to show us because they were having a hard time with it. They were struggling with it. It was new for them. They didn't think, in some cases even, that anybody would ever want to show it because it was so far out of the norm for them. And 
that maybe it just wouldn't be right, you know? So then the, the scheme is that the turret is just a, uh, it's a facade and it rests on the structure that we made last night. Yeah. Like I said, those wheels in the show are pretty robust, they're pretty dimensional. Oh, yeah. They have a, they, I've got a, They're going to fit inside the wheel. Another one's down. I'm going to do it again. There's just something about repetition that I really like. Now. I need to come out just a bit. Okay. Just a bit more. Tell me where I'm where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Um I think it's like this and rotate. This is the main gallery space which you can kind of see. Uh, the glass partition is here. The front entry will be here, and once people come into this entry, when they approach, what they will see is, in fact, um, the glass with an image on that is sort of fills the space of the front of the New Scotland Armory. The doors will align. You'll open up the door. And this is interesting because this is the first time I believe that there's been an exhibition opening at the gallery when the glass was closed. Is that true? That's, yeah. And so the doors will open and what you'll be confronted by is um, this doughboy in dazzle paint um, defending the staircase, our first little joke, and then the sort of mass of the tech, which because of its placement, will feel like an entire tank when in fact it's just a facade. And you'll be forced down through here. You'll come through, come around. Also, you could come through underneath the treads into the salon space, which is over here. Or, hopefully, you'll see the light of the other video, which is being projected back here, sort of dazzle you at the back and that will draw you back into this pressure point and underneath here, at which point you will re-enter into the salon itself, which should be like a completely different experience. Once you're in here, you can spend some time in there, and then you can either come back out or exit underneath the treads here and come back out into the space. I didn't want